Thanks for joining us on the Page One Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Peters, CEO of Newer Appliances. And in this episode of the Page One Podcast, we're going to learn from Mark Atkinson, and we're going to talk about 301 tariffs, this crazy worldwide supply chain problem we're in right now. And we're going to talk about his new role with Kuhn Recon. Before we get into this great episode and super timely episode, let me just try to pitch you guys on this uh, new charitable organization I'm starting up at vetcation.org. If you have a vacation rental home, uh, we need your help here. If you're, you, you want to help out a military family, we're connecting with veteran families, trying to give them a dream vacation. But what we need are more um, vacation homeowners to kind of contribute their homes. And that's what we're doing at vetcation.org. Uh, swing on over there and check it out or uh, find me on LinkedIn if you want to get more information on that. It's a great cause and uh, you'll really be helping out some families. And I know if you have one of these vacation homes, you got plenty of open bookings. Um, you know, busy season may be full, but you'll have open bookings in between season. And that's kind of the point here. Help out some of these families that way. Great. So moving on, uh, let's get into this episode with Mark. Mark is the current president at Kunrikan Corporation. He's got 19 years of experience in the housewares industry for so many brands. Um, he knows all the companies, all the brands and the government affairs as well. And he was recently um, VP at the International Housewares Association where I got to know him a little bit. Um, he's got deep know-how in the supply chain, uh, all the customers that are out there in the, in this, in the brand universe of IHA and all things tariffs and government affairs. So we're gonna dive into those, some of those things today, especially this crazy supply chain. So Mark, welcome to the Page One Podcast. Thank you, Luke. Happy to be on. Awesome. So, hey, Mark, why don't you just give uh, everybody a little bit of context about, um, you know, a little bit about Kunrikon and your role over there and what you're working on. Sure, sure. So, Kunrikon is a company we are based, and the global company is based in Recon, Switzerland, uh, with subsidiaries we have in Great Britain, in Spain, and of course, the USA-based subsidiary that I lead here. Um, we are over all of the sales into North and South America. Products sold in more than 40 countries. Basically, our strategy is to provide innovative, high-quality tools to kind of both the home chef and the, the enthusiast cook that's out there in the market. So we're excited to uh, provide gadgets, cookware, a lot of different tools, um, and of course, based on that Swiss design, Swiss quality to the market. Great. And, and what are some of the key customers, Mark, that you guys are selling into? You know, we typically sell into the mid to high-end parts of the market, so we're happy to sell to customers like Sir Tab, William Sonoma. Of course, our products are sold through Amazon. Um, we do a great business with QVC, so a lot of our products are able to be described and, and told you know, how to operate, how they solve issues in Cook's lives. Um, so QVC is also a really, really great partner for us. And then just the um, overall size of the U.S. Uh, subsidiary that you're going to be leading? Um, the overall size of it? Yeah, that maybe the people, the footprint, any, any way to, that you want to kind of share the scale of, of kind of the organization over here. Sure, sure. I, always, I, I slowed down a little bit because obviously family owned, we're family owned out of, uh, out of Switzerland. So a private organization, but you know, we're widely distributed all across the U S I mean, you can find us in most of the major independent retailers, even the small stores, but, um, you know, we have representatives all across the country, typically independent representatives. Um, our sales force, uh, internal sales force is located here in Novato, California. And, um, and pretty much we service the entire country in that mid to high end parts of the market. That's awesome. And then, you know, Mark, with your background, you have such a, you know, varied background. And like I said, kind of when we were talking, you know, more about things like tariffs and government affairs than anybody I've, I've had a chance to work with. Um, how do you, you know, looking at your broad background, how do you think that's going to help you be a better leader at Kunrakan? Well, I think it just gives me that macro view um, to be able to look at it. I mean, because obviously tariffs impact us here dramatically. Um, a lot of the current Section 301 tariffs are are levied on our products that are coming in uh, from China. Um, I think what it does, it gives me kind of the ability to, to understand and keep up with the current developments that are happening at a governmental level um, and watching those and also to try to help influence those in certain ways. Because certainly, it, like I said, it's a direct impact to us here in our bottom line to our consumers, to our retailers that are enduring the higher prices. Um, right now, you know, U.S. consumers have, have paid over $80 billion in these Section 301 tariffs. It's, it's a big impact no matter who your company is if, you're, if they're being levied on your products. So for me, I think it just helps me understand and also helps me 
gauge ways that we can try to mitigate those costs. You know, look at where do we, where are we manufacturing products? You know, are we going to be able to, to take advantage of any exclusion processes that have been in the past and are also being uh, hopefully looked at uh, based on some new bills that are out there um, in the very near future. So being able to help lead that with our organization, understanding those processes should help me here try to mitigate some of those costs. And what do you see as like the most significant challenges facing companies today? I mean, you know, we're talking about it now, supply chain and tariffs. Um, but I mean, we even have consumer shifts, you know, resulting from COVID. Uh, you know, I want to ask questions about how you guys are seeing that. You know, some companies are, are seeing leveling out on uh, sales. Others are not. Just overall, you know, would like to hear you talk about that. Uh, significant changes facing companies and kind of what the next six months holds. Sure. I mean, I think for us, like most companies that were in our industry in the, in the kitchen housewares industry, we benefited through COVID. Honestly, you know, the demand consumer demand shifted toward our products, not away from it. People were not going to restaurants. Um, they were eating at home more often, cooking, learning new methods to cook because we have products really all across that spectrum from cookware to gadgets, you know, to baking a few baking products. We were able to benefit from that. Now I would say that in, here in recent weeks, last month, month and a half, we're seeing some softening of that demand, I think, to be expected as the markets begin to reopen fully. Um, even here in California, June 15th is supposed to be an important date that we're supposed to reopen as a state. I think there's pent up demand to get out, do things other than stay at home and cook. Um, restaurants are beginning to reopen all across the country. So we're seeing a little bit of softening of that, but it's still a, a really good dynamic market for us. I think the shift to e-commerce has been a good a good thing for us because we're heavily uh, engaged with, with key e-commerce retailers. So seeing a softening, but I think still long-term, I think that we will still see a benefit from those consumer habits that have shifted to doing more cooking at home. I think they'll soften for a period, but some of those won't go away for the long term. I think people will continue to cook more at home uh, for the near future. Yeah. And, it, and some of it is just hard to tell because of the supply chain where, you know, maybe they're softening, maybe there isn't, but not everybody has the same product that they had before and, you know, prices had to change. Like there's been all these dynamic changes, right? It's not just like one thing changed. So it's really, really hard to measure it. But I, I kind of feel the same way. I think, you know, my expectation is we should continue to see growth over last year even um, because there's a lot of other things in the, in the mix. Uh and, um, and, and kind of that's our plan until, you know, that I saw container prices were going to be costing, you know, over 10 grand <laughs> or more. So we'll talk about that later. But before we get into it, let's talk about tariffs. There's been, um, I forget what the, what the group is, the national, uh, there's some national manufacturer association. You know, there's, a, there's a number of them. You know, we've been heavily, even when I was at IHA and then now here at Penrecon, I'm, I'm involved with a, with a group called Americans for Free Trade, which really brings together, you know, 160 trade associations across the, the entire broad spectrum of business in the United States, but also individual companies like ours that are interested in what's going on legislatively and what's happening in D.C. to try to combat some of the tariff trade policies that have, have resulted in significant increases in cost to U.S. businesses. So Americans for Free Trade may be who you were thinking of. Um, and that, that's one that we, we really stay involved with now just to try to keep updated on what's going on. And there's daily happenings that's going on right now. Um, uh, there was, uh, there's a bill right now that's being voted on today, actually, that with the Senate that uh, is addressing some of the trade challenges that we have in the tariff, the Section 301 tariff. Yeah, and that's, that's what I wanted to get into. I mean, there definitely is, are some developments happening, and some of the comments um, have been favorable, it seems, to addressing at least... Uh, um, you know, rolling back, I don't know about rolling back tariffs, but maybe rolling back some of the exclusions or, or even to current day, uh, maybe not retroactive, but on a go forward, I think is, is, or some of the language that I've heard that they're pushing for, but do you have any additional thoughts on that or predictions about, you know, where this seems to be going, especially with uh, exclusions, I guess. Sure. Sure. I mean, I think exclusions are a big part of this. You know, the process was mostly flawed, honestly, and some of the, the, original exclusion procedures that happened um, with the various rounds of tariffs. Um, they changed with each round and wasn't very transparent. How the decisions happened was not very transparent or even logical in some cases. But the, you know, the, the bill that's out today, the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which is being voted on in the Senate today, 
does have a component that specifically addresses the Section 301 tariffs, and it was added, uh, what was originally the Trade Act of 2021, was added as an amendment to that bill that's being voted on today. And that amendment vote was bipartisan, a 91 to 4 vote, which was which is impressive. And it really sets up a couple of things. It sets up a new exclusion process for the, ex- the existing Section 301 tariffs, but it also specifically requires the USTR to reinstate all exclusions from the tariffs for entries filed on or before December 31st of 2022. So there is some re- retroactivity um, based on certain li- liquidations or reliquidations, but it's, it's not overly broad where it includes everything. But what's important is this probably will pass today, but of course it goes to the House and there's not not real good information out there yet on what the House plans to do with this bill. But certainly we would be very supportive of the, of the passage of this bill and also including that Trade Act of 2021 as part of it. That would be very, very beneficial to our company and to, I would assume, almost anybody else situated similar to us. Yeah, that would. Do you know if it was a, is this a Democratic proposal? I mean, they have the majority in the um, House, or I wonder who's pushing this one. Um, the ranking member, Senate member um, from Idaho, Republican, actually forced mm-hmm. the vote to include the amendment. Um, so, but it, but at 91 to 4, there was broad support. This, yeah. this addresses other issues in there. It's not just based on the exclusion process. There's a lot of really good trade, la- trade language and enforcement in there. I think some of the things that the previous administration wanted to address would be addressed. And I think legislative legislatively is the right way to approach this. Let's, you know, instead of just doing things uh, from either administration, you know, from the top down and through, you know, presidential orders, I think doing things legislatively would be the best way to approach this. And this bill is a, is a very good start with that. Okay. And then let's break it down a little bit more. So if this bill were to pass, and again, it's got a ways to go, if it mm-hmm. were to pass, it would reenact exclusions for products only hitting in 2022 or would it have any effect on 2021? No, it's, it's, it's basically reinstating all the exclusions from tariffs prior to that December 31st, 2022. So of course all dates oh, would wow. be prior to that. So those previous exclusions would come back and I don't know the exact language on the retroactivity of it. Certainly it would help us from here forward, right? You know, up until the end of 2022, that would help us all because, the exclusions, if we, if any of us enjoyed any of the exclusions that were out there, we would be able to come back and, and get those again, which would be good. There are some key, I've got to look and see for our company, which exclusions were applicable, but I do know from an industry side, because I was involved at IHA, that we had some real key product categories in the industry that was, uh, that had some exclusions out there that were very, very beneficial um, in some very large categories. So it would help our industry as a whole. But certainly all of us, if we have any exclusion opportunities out there, we would want to go back and look at those and make sure that we take advantage of them if this bill is passed in its current wording. Yeah, no, that, that's incredible. Now, what about the timing of it? Um, how, how would this work on the next step? So if it did pass today, you know, we'll find out. There's no there's no way to predict this. You know, this is Correct. just uh, conjecture, I guess. But what would be the timing of when it could actually be passed um, by the House? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I don't have the answer for that. It would depend on whether they put it on to, to bring it up, whether it hits the floor, it would probably hit some committee first. Yeah. Um, because it has, you know, because it has the trade act included in it, it would, it would almost have to go or at least be involved with the house ways and means committee. So it's going to hit some committees first and then who knows, you know, how those are going to be, how it would be butchered up from that point forward. But, Again, I think the most positive aspect of this is the bipartisan nature that that particular act was included, but it certainly will pose some challenges in getting the overall U.S. Innovation Competition Act pushed through. And and it's going to be, there's going to be some challenges ahead. I I don't know that it would come through in its current wording, but certainly we hope that key pieces of this is, uh, is left in the bill. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's so hard to predict these things, but at the same time, at least it overall, you know, everything. I always like to look at momentum, and it seems like the momentum is moving this direction, you know. But like you said, a lot of things could get butchered, and I think if you know, on the financial analysis, you know, it's going to be a lot of dollars going back to businesses, a lot, and. Sure. Uh, I don't know if that'd be looked at favorably or negatively given the climate right now. Uh, a lot of those are small companies that need that revenue back, uh, you know, but 
I guess we'll have to wait and see where it goes, but I, I like the, the momentum, at least it's kind of coming in the right direction here. And then, you know, we all just have to keep running our businesses and, and this would just be, you know, a really nice, uh, plus, I guess something that could happen. Sure. We'll have to keep a close eye on it. Yeah. And I think it does align. You, you'd ask kind of whether, you know, who proposed it and what's the push, whether it be Democrat, Republican, whichever, you know, the other thing that happened today was the administration released its key findings under the executive order, the America's supply chain order. And that really was laying out some of the, the steps forward that the administration was going to take on, on key trade issues. Um, and specific ones that were trade related is, is the administration's plan on how they're going to deal with like the unfair trade practices. And so they've created this trade strike force that's led by the USTR um, that's going to be able to propose unilateral, multilateral enforcement actions against these foreign trade practices. So they're, they're actually setting a team in place that's going to be able to kind of provide those recommendations and have some enforcement ability on some of these trade practices that, that the Section 301 tariffs were designed to give leverage to it, to attack these things. Hopefully they're going to find other methods to do so, right? That's the, as I look at that, I think it's positive in the fact that let's put a team in place that can find other mechanisms, um, including trade agreements, including working with the other regional partners. Let's find other ways to, to, le- to provide leverage against China versus just tariffs, which companies like yours, mine, others in the industry are paying. Yeah. And that makes it, t- I think that's what people were kind of thinking about from the very beginning. We're, we're the ones kind of, kind of, uh, you know, bearing the brunt of this. Um, it's, it's hard though. I don't know. We'll see what, we'll see what they come up with. Sure. I, th- I, I think, think that was the problem was that no one had another really great suggestion. Yeah, they <laughs> you know, did. Everyone always asked, well, what else, what else would you do if you were the one leading this? If I was USTR, what would I do? Yep. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it is a very, very difficult issue. And I think tariffs, you know, were at least some leverage for a period of time. The problem is now they're, they're kind of acclimated into the system. And at what point do we get to get that back? Or is this just now part of, part of our supply chain cost? Well, I think, yeah, I, I don't know what they're thinking, but uh, I don't think there was a better answer if, you know, people were kind of trying to change up the supply chain and change up where products were coming from. Because, sure. you know, every, you, every, we all complained about it, but there wasn't another good answer. And uh, I think that, you know, maybe they're just trying to hit a big enough number where, hey, it would make sense to near shore. But I mean, we're just not there right now. So right. I, I don't know how much was accomplished. Um. Hey, Mark, let, let's move off of tariffs, you know, my probably my least favorite subject, but an important one <laughs> on, to, on to my next least favorite. And that's this crazy supply chain. I mean, this is literally like the craziest supply chain in the last, you know, 40 years, what people are saying, at least in my last 20 years, for sure. Uh, I mean, there's container costs are now and, and I'll just go back in time a little bit and tell you. So at the turn at the you know beginning of this year, um, I think we I think we were looking at some container price is going up in like $4,000, maybe 5,000. And then we had this uh, crazy situation where we couldn't get stuff offloaded. So we were paying demerge fees and we couldn't get it out of the port on time. Like all that happened at the beginning of the year. And I thought, this is, this is ridiculous. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. And the predictions, you know, people were saying, well, okay, it's going to be fine by summer. We just got to get through the next couple months. So, so that was kind of the approach we took. It'll be fine by summer and thinking it's, it's going to roll over. But now it looks like this is going to get worse. It's going to get worse into the end of the year and, and worse into, uh, you know, maybe even Q1. I mean, why don't we just start there? You know, what is your kind of supply chain prediction as far as costs go and the ability to even get goods uh, kind of to the end of this year and into next year? What are you thinking? Well, just when we think that things start easing based on one situation, whether it's container capacity or ship capacity, container supply, the port issues here in the U.S. And, you know, we, as Kun Recon, we've, we've endured every one of those issues, same as you. Then there's new issues that creep up. You know, the, we, we, you and I were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, the, the port closure in South China, at Yantian. That, that's a new issue that now is causing new backups, new issues that they're saying is going to, you know, this is due to COVID. If some of you haven't heard, you know, there was a new COVID variant, the Delta variant that, that, was identified there and it's causing issues throughout the Guangzhou region. And, um, you know, it's backing up, you know, we ship through that port regularly. It's one of our major ports that we ship through and we're having to reroute some shipments. We're having to, um, 
you know, to just deal with the, the, um, the issues there and congestion, you know, that congestion is going to last for weeks once it gets fully reopened. Um, some of the predictions that, that they have that I don't have that others have is that this could cause, cause issues, as you mentioned earlier, all the way into 2022. So just when something starts to really resolve itself, let's say the COVID issues that we've had here in the U.S., you know, that, that even though they were essential, the challenges of getting port workers and you know, we were having boats backing up to the ports for, for weeks, we're still seeing some of that, by the way. Um, you know, those are really kind of starting to ease a little bit, but then you have other issues that creep up like this issue in China. Um, my prediction is it's going to continue to be challenging uh, all the way through at least the end of this year and early 2022. I just don't think we see enough things that are resolving themselves that is going to uh, solve the supply issue. Because, I mean, we, as most other companies, we need more product. You know, we're ordering products as heavy as we can. Lead times are, are going way out, uh, you know, 90 to 120 to even much, much longer <laughs> months in some cases. Um, you know, I, I think because that product need is still there, it's going to continue through the holiday season where U.S. consumer demand is, is pent up and will be unleashed this year, I believe. Um, I think it's just going to continue to cause issues with, with capacity. And I, there's no way for them to catch up during this time frame. Yeah, so it's it's complicated because it's not like, see, the thing is like on the long-term view, we can look at this problem and say, okay, well, we got to be careful and just order what we need. But I don't know how order what we need helps us if demand's going to continue to be high and if, you know, we have an order what you need mindset and then all of a sudden we're out of stock because because the lead times expanded or because we couldn't get stuff on a boat. So all all of the just in time and order what you need is 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 kind of going out the window right now. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we kind of have to, I guess you got to make sure you're at least making margin and then you got to order, right? I mean, yeah. you got you to keep your warehouse full. That. I mean, I don't want to share too many competitive things, but that's what we're doing. I mean, we're, we're ordering numbers that we would have never ordered should all of this be normal. Um, you know, we're, we're pushing and at least looking at the goods that are, you know, what's driving 80% of our revenue. Let's make sure that we're in stock long-term on these. We may be taking a few more inventory risks than we would have normally. Thankfully, we're in a position to do so. I mean, the main thing is I want to be able to supply our retailers, supply our, our um, those that are buying our products, supply consumers. And so for us, we are buying in heavier than we normally would. Um, you know, where we would normally keep three, you know, three months worth of inventory on certain items. We're looking at six to nine months worth of inventory on items that we're, we're flowing in orders right now. The main thing is just getting them. You know, even though we have the orders out there, we're still struggling to get those orders filled. Yeah. And I've had, uh, you know, I mean, everybody's had to pass on a price increase and, but I've had a couple of friends who had had to pass on their second price increase. Sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, customer, I mean, the, you know, our customers one way or another, uh, there's, there's just no way to avoid these rising prices, but at the same time, you know, they don't want to see the price increase cause they don't want to pass it on to their customers, which is understandable, but something's got to give, uh, I guess, you know, are we into the, the new world of, of two price increases a year instead of one a year? I mean, where, you know, where, where might this go? I mean, if we're responsibly managing our businesses, we probably are. Um, yeah you can only let margins erode so far. Um, and I mentioned to you pre-call, you know, we have some material suppliers that are literally giving us the pricing on an order by order basis. Uh, that makes it extremely difficult to manage your, your processes of, uh, and cost, you know, what we quote out. Yes, we were doing annual price quotes right now. We're, we're dating them at least for six months, but certainly we, we still put in the same caveats that, you know, they're still subject to change, you know, depending on cost increases. So it's twice a year or more often, you know, depending on really what happens with the variability of these material costs and shipping costs. The, the, tr the struggle is both of them going up at the same time. Um, you know, that can quickly eat up all of your margin and then all of a sudden you're not profitable. Um, I think you just have to be good partners with the retailers, good partners with those that you're selling to. They understand that they're buying products direct. They know what's going on. But, you know, there's only certain uh, amounts of increases that are going to be able to be absorbed throughout the system and, and acceptable to consumers. And I think we're all doing our best to mitigate those costs, but they're a reality right now. We're, we're all dealing with it. Yeah. And, and just like you talked about, let's talk about nearshoring. So first we had the tariffs, you know, up to, up to 25%. Okay. Was that going to be enough to, you know, move uh, to nearshoring? You know, for most people, the answer was no, but definitely, you know, some, some, uh, 
companies had to kind of diversify, move into Vietnam or other areas. Um, and it just made sense at that point, but maybe not enough to bring it back here to the States and, and maybe not enough to say, bring it to Mexico, but it, but it was definitely worth a second look, but now you got this freight and not only the freight, but like the lead times and you know, the demerge or the detention and all this other, you know, crazy new terms I'm, I'm learning over here when I see the invoices. Uh, but you know, I know in your business, you guys can make product, um, you know, Swiss made product, but you know, so many other companies like you, you know, you have such a large network. Have you seen companies actually be able to nearshore, uh, with these extra added costs? You know, I think nearshoring is, is still a challenge. I would say, you know, I saw more companies when I was at IJ that I was working with that was really looking more to other Southeast Asian locations, you know, looking at Vietnam, looking at Indonesia, looking at other regions there. There were, there were the same challenges or some similar challenges to, to shifting production into those areas. You even saw Chinese companies that were setting up operations in these countries to take advantage of that. Um, you know, I think that's still continuing, and I did see companies shifting to those. We do some manufacturing in, in Vietnam. We also do uh, a lot of manufacturing at our own factory in Switzerland, but also having we have other relationships with other manufacturers based in Switzerland that we're we're starting to ship some goods there. Um, it's one of those things where you can get European quality, you can get Swiss made items that are, that are very high quality, but at a competitive price due to all the challenges that we currently have. You know, we already have goods flowing from our factory that's based in Recon. Um, so, you know, having that ability for us has helped. Um, when you think of nearshoring, obviously, you'd want to think of, you know, being manufactured in the U.S. or being manufactured in Mexico, something very close. We've looked at Mexico. We still have some con some concerns there um, just for our goods, um, just in the ability for us to be there, to, to visit, to be safe. There's some concerns that we have, but certainly um, all the challenges that we have makes it look more and more attractive by the day. Um, when you look at the, the timing, you know, for us is really just has, has been really tough, you know, just be able to get goods. And of course, these crazy cost increases that we're seeing does make Mexico look uh, a little more attractive. Um, you know, the USMCA agreement is, is attractive. There's some protections. There's some agreements in place for free trade. So... You know, I think certainly any companies that are manufacturing need to at least be looking at those, and we're doing so. We haven't found good options yet. Right now, our best options are the Swiss-based products that are coming in. We're excited to be able to launch more of those. But uh, I think it does force companies and, and has forced companies to look outside of China. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but the cool thing is like having Swiss-based product definitely could be a fun marketing advantage for you, right? I mean, people are, sure. yeah, you, you, it played up just like, you know, made in America, made in Switzerland definitely is going to have, a, you know, a positive influence on the brand quality. Um, and I think for your brand, you, you know, higher quality brand anyways. Uh, yeah, so that that's, you know, a little bit of a silver lining on there. Um, it you know, uh, it, so th this is just a comment and this, this is just from a uh, you know, a meeting I was on earlier this morning was that the prediction on the prices, like where will the prices go from here? Um, you know, recording um, early June right now. And and I'll, I'll try to launch this in a couple of days. So, you know, right around June 15, we'll be launching this episode. That'll be, that'll be what I shoot for because I know some of this is time sensitive, but like I was talking about, we were paying, you know, five, $6,000 a container. Then we're paying, you know, seven, eight. The prediction I heard was West Coast will go to 15,000 a container or so, which by the way, I've already seen uh, from some quotes. Um, and East Coast will go up to 22,000 a container. So, I mean, this is just, it's just in, in the thing is on some of these containers, you know, I got friends and their containers, the value of the container may only be $25,000, right? The goods inside. So you're talking about a, just a massive uh, increase, you know, per unit cost. Uh, so I guess it kind of factors into it. So talking about this, do you see, okay, so prices are going to have to go up. They're already going up. Every, every price on everything is going up. I was at a car dealership and, and uh, you know, they're asking between 25 and a hundred thousand dollar premium on cars. So you got a sticker price, add 25 to a hundred thousand dollar premium. If you don't want it too bad, there's none left anyways. It, 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 this is the world we're in. So do you think that this could, that could lead to a consumer demand slowdown? Like if, what if the prices go up too fast, too much, too fast? 
I think absolutely it will. I mean, I think it, if the container prices that you just mentioned come to reality, um, that will force all of us to think differently about how we source. And because we're the same way. We have typically, you know, even though they're high quality, we have lower cost goods in our gadgets and things like that. So you look at the container cost, if it's if it gets anywhere near the twenty to twenty five thousand dollar range, that changes the calculation dramatically for us. You know, so we would have to start looking at a Mexico or any or other places because there's no way that consumers would be willing to take on that kind of cost increase. By the time you you take into account margins on top of that for each of the, the steps in the supply chain, that's a huge increase in retail prices. Um, you know, you mentioned cars, go try to buy a used car right now. I mean, look at the values on used cars. They're, they're through the roof because no one can get new cars. Um, you know, so there's, I think this overall, you hate to say inflation because obviously how we measure inflation, things are still muted a little bit, but prices for goods are, are going up. And if it continues at the rate that it's going or accelerates, I do believe it's going to impact demand. It has to, I think it's already starting to in the building sector. You know, housing starts were down. Um, you know, I'm actually working on a remodel myself at a home, and it, it's made me think twice about uh, some of the things that we're doing. And I'll I'll wait a little bit longer on some things just because of the of the cost of putting a new roof on, cost of framing. Those things are are higher, and I'm a consumer for those goods. So I do believe that the rate of increase is already starting to affect consumer demand, and and will only affect it more as we go forward. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, it's such a fluid situation. You know, I just try to be open-minded on everything who know, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next. We just have to be, you know, really agile and, and, uh, kind of be able to react at the same time. We, we do have to plan because these supply chains aren't fast, yeah. right? Like you said, you know, products like 90 days is now fast on a lead time and, and it could, it could take longer than that. So there's kind of two sides to it, but, um, Listen, this has been a great conversation, Mark. Um, and, and and by the way, I'm really glad I'm getting to connect with you. Uh, so it it's really has been a pleasure. But why don't we finish up with, um, I would just kind of put you on the spot here. Would love to think about how you're thinking about strategic, like the strategic vision. Um, you know, being the president, you have to run strategy and uh, kind of make these decisions that are going to kind of impact the near and the long term. Obviously, you know, some of these things, you know, are not going to be kind of, in our circle of control. Like, you know, we can react to the supply chain, but at the end of the day, um, they're negotiating freight rates is kind of gone now and we just have to make decisions. So strategically, you know, what are two or three things that stand out in your mind that you're, you're really, really focused on? Well, for me, I think it's number one, we have to maintain quality and innovation. You know, for us, we have to continue to invest in, in quality products wherever we're sourcing that, whether it's in Asia, it's in Switzerland, it's in Vietnam, um, excuse me, China, Switzerland, Vietnam for us, other locations considering Mexico, those we have to keep quality up. We have to service our customers and our consumers to a very, very high level. That's important to our brand statement. So also we have to partner. We have to partner with our retailers. We have to partner with those that, that are selling our product. This volatility makes that even more important that we're working together to keep supply up, we're able to provide them with products, but also that we're partners on how we're pricing these goods and that we we price at a level that, that can keep everybody um, in business, um, but also make sure that we're protecting the consumer and not um, not putting prices at a level that, that are not sustainable out there to the consumers. So for us, I think it's that. It's partner with the retailers, keep service levels and quality up to a very high level and be flexible. You know, We're gonna have to be flexible with how we source flexible to where we source and just make sure that we're looking for every avenue to mitigate all of these price increases that are coming at us, whether it be tariffs, it be supply chain, materials, we're just getting hit in all different areas and we have to be creative in how we address each of those. So for me, it's looking at the top level of those things and, and then really help guiding the organization to make sure that we're, we're being creative in how we address them. Well, listen, that's uh, quality is always number one and uh, in, in, you know, living by that brand promise. So I think that's, that's great because it's easy to kind of get, you know, lose sight of that, you know, we're in the middle of these kind of tumultuous times, but at the end of the day, the, you know, these things are going to pass. We don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to pass. And, you know, we have to stick to the, to the brand and the quality um, and, and just to kind of avoid being that commodity. So I think that's a good way to finish it up. Um, 
I'll say though, this is, this is one of those crazy things. It's like, you know, we're all, you know, 20 years from now, everybody will always remember, you know, 2020 and COVID and, uh, you know, people leading businesses are always going to remember it all the way through 2021 and this crazy supply chain. It's going to, it's, it's just one of those things that, um, everything kind of aligned to create this craziness. Uh, and we all just have to navigate it. So hopefully, you know, those listening can, uh, you know, get some good nuggets of information here to, to help uh, guide their companies. And, and I really appreciate your expert opinion today. Uh, and thanks for being on the podcast, Mark. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the invite and uh, take care. And hey, Mark, before I let you go, how can listeners uh, find you, connect with you, or learn more about your company? Well, just um, just go to our website, coonrecon.us, um, see our products, everything from gadgets, cookware, um, everything that, that that home chef needs. So I'd love, to, uh, love for you to uh, support our product. Thank you, Luke. You got it, Mark. And we'll have the links in the show notes. And again, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us. Um, really appreciate your reviews on iTunes and hope you join us for the next interview.